Hi everybody and welcome to Love Fraud Live. Many people when describing narcissists say that they have no empathy. Maybe you've said this about a narcissist that you know. But believe it or not, research shows that this may not be totally accurate. I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com, and tonight I'll explain narcissists and their apparent lack of empathy. At the end of this presentation, I'll answer your questions. So to join the chat or ask a question, please subscribe to this channel. A key trait of narcissistic personality disorder is the lack of empathy. At least that's what most mental health professionals believe. And this is backed up by the DSM-5, which is the manual, the Bible for mental health professionals. It lists a lack of empathy in the official diagnostic criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. But clinical research has failed to establish that narcissists lack empathy. How can this be? Many of us have endured firsthand the devastating lack of empathy exhibited by narcissists, antisocials, and psychopaths. Well, it turns out that there are two types of empathy, and these disordered individuals often lack one of them, but not the other. When you understand this, you'll also understand why their behavior is so confusing. The information in this video summarizes the findings of three scientific papers about narcissism and empathy. If you want to know more, you can read the entire papers. There are links in the window below this video. Okay, so first of all, what is empathy? Empathy has been described as everyday mind reading. That's a great description. Empathy evolved over millennia to help us rapidly discern the motivations of others. The potential to develop empathy is usually hardwired into our brains and emerges in the second year of life. Empathy has been defined as a sense of similarity between the feelings one experiences and those expressed by others. This sounds simple, but it's not. Empathy is actually a complex form of psychological inference involving observation, memory, knowledge, and reasoning. Many psychologists believe that empathy involves three processes. Number one, feeling what another person is feeling. Number two, knowing what another person is feeling. And number three, having the intention to respond compassionately to another person's distress. True empathy requires both the ability to share the emotional experience of the other person and the ability to intellectually understand the other person's experience. These abilities therefore distinguish the two types of empathy. The first one, emotional empathy, refers to a person's ability to feel and respond to another's emotional state. Then there's cognitive empathy. This refers to a person's intellectual ability to understand and identify the mental states underlying another person's behavior and experience. This is also called theory of mind. Emotional and cognitive empathy use different parts of the brain. Emotional empathy usually develops before cognitive empathy. So when an infant or toddler doesn't seem to react to another person's distress, it may be an early warning sign that he or she is at risk for developing a lack of empathy and antisocial behavior. So, let's discuss narcissists and empathy. Researchers have found growing evidence 
that narcissists display significant impairments in emotional empathy, but little to no impairment in cognitive empathy. In other words, many narcissists can intellectually understand what you're feeling, but they do not have their own emotional reaction to your feelings. The same applies to antisocials and psychopaths. Research also suggests that narcissists can use their cognitive empathy when they want to, and they'll do this when they see some benefit for themselves in appearing empathetic. When narcissists don't see any gain for themselves in using their empathy, or when they simply don't want to deal with your feelings, they turn off their cognitive empathy. Therefore, it is not accurate to say that narcissists, along with antisocials and psychopaths, simply lack empathy. It's more precise to say that although these disordered individuals may not respond emotionally to the feelings of others, they are intellectually capable of understanding those feelings. So perhaps this explains your confusion about narcissists and empathy. If you have sometimes seen empathetic reactions from the narcissist in your life, and then other times he or she has been totally dismissive of your feelings, now you know why. Emotional empathy is impaired in narcissists, but cognitive empathy is not. They intellectually understand what you are feeling. If they have something to gain by appearing compassionate, then they'll do it. If they see no benefit for themselves, they'll ignore your feelings or (laughs) criticize you for being too emotional. How many of us have seen that one? In summary, narcissists are not totally without empathy. They can use their cognitive empathy when they want to, but in practice, they only display this empathy when it suits their agenda. So that's the presentation for tonight. Next, I'll answer your questions. If you ever want in-depth advice for your own situation, I do offer personal consultations and a deep emotional release service to help you recover from uh, emotional wounds. There is a link in the description below the video. Oh, so Patricia is here from England again. We'll say hello, wave, nice little wave that you have there. One in the morning, you're up late. Okay, so K Clock says, Is impaired empathy usually linked to childhood trauma? So why does this happen? There can be some element of that. Um, When it comes to personality disorders, because there's there's a, a couple different things going on here. When it comes to personality disorders, there is usually a genetic component Um, to people who have these disorders. In other words, um, people who have narcissistic personality disorder, um, antisocial personality disorder, and psychopathy often have been born with a genetic predisposition to this disorders. Now, this has been very well researched in psychopathy and um, maybe also in uh, narcissism and antisocial personality disorder, but definitely in psychopathy. So what happens is that a child can be born with a genetic predisposition to the personality disorders. And then through, uh, there, there is an interaction with nature and nurture. So uh, depending on the type of parenting that the person gets, or also, um, you know, the environment that they grow up in, you know, what type of neighborhood it is, if it's a difficult crime neighborhood or, or anything along those lines, all of these things can influence whether or not the genetic predisposition actually, they call it expresses, whether um, the, the genes of um, antisocial personality disorder or psychopathy 
manifest and the person develops those traits. So there is this interaction between nature and nurture. Now, that's for the personality disorders, which is one way that somebody could have a lack of empathy. Um, I would imagine, although I don't have a lot of um, research on this personally, that other situations can contribute to a lack of empathy, including the tri childhood trauma. I mean, a, a kid who's been traumatized, you know, even though um, they may not have a genetic predisposition, it's probably possible that it could affect their empathy. Um, I, I'm not real uh, knowledgeable as far as research on this and just taking a guess of what we know about trauma, um, that it certainly can affect you. So I would say that that, that is also a possibility. Okay, so my narcissistic partner doesn't show emotional empathy towards me, yet shows cognitive empathy towards things he watches on the news. This is uh, Patricia in the UK is saying that. And that sounds like a perfect example of what we're talking about. You know, th this your, your partner just can't have, uh, doesn't feel what you feel, but can understand you know, the problems or, or uh, of, of what he may see in world events or something that happens in, 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 in the UK or, or whatever. So that kind of makes perfect sense. It, it sounds like an example of exactly what we're talking about here. So Manduzi says, is it dangerous to engage with narcissists for short-term sexual relationships? I would always encourage people to avoid anyone who they think is a narcissist. Um, nothing good can come out of any type of involvement with a narcissist. And, you know, the problem with sex, and even if you go into it thinking you're going to have a short-term short sexual relationship, you know, your biology doesn't necessarily agree with that, you know, because anytime you um, have sexual relations, it releases all this oxytocin in your body, and oxytocin is it's called the cuddle chemical. It, it it what enables you to bond with other people. So even if you don't want to, you may find yourself becoming bonded and and hooked um, on this person and, and on the relationship. So. Um, I, I wouldn't advise at all. If, if your eyes are open and, and you see that the person um, has narcissistic or antisocial or psychopathic personality disorder, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't get involved with that at all. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just you're, you're playing with fire and, you know, you may think that you're strong enough. And, and, and I've had I've had this happen. Uh, people have told me about this. I remember one particular person who, um, you know, had a sexual relationship with someone um, who was, you know, clearly narcissistic and, and she admitted right up front that all she wanted was the sex. Well, it didn't work out that way. You know, she ended up traumatized, you know, because of the experience. So, you know, you, you may not be able to maintain um, whatever level of control that you think you have. So I, I would definitely say that's not a good idea. Okay, um, so Gerard says, I know someone who is very generous in giving to overseas aid programs, but cruel to his wife and children. Well, that's a classic. Um, I can tell you I've heard plenty of cases of that. In fact, um, I have this one case in my most recent book, which is called Senior Sociopaths. And it's, uh, um, I have a lot of stories there that, you know, people provided to me. And one story, uh, this guy was talking about his father. And this man um, married, the, the, the guy's, um, my reader's mother was had generational wealth. I mean, you know, family line, you know, going back hundreds of years or something like that and really had lots and lots and lots of money. So the father married into it and his prime objective was to 
um, you know, take advantage of, of the money. Um, although he managed to hide that for a long time uh, until he had uh, his wife convinced that she was incompetent and had, you know, built up all his uh, resources and um, um, flying monkeys, you know, c cohorts and things like that. But he did this all the time. You know, he would he would donate money, you know, philosophically, uh, you know, philanthropy, and because uh, he wanted to be known as this generous philanthropist. But in the meantime, you know, he didn't want to help his daughter, who had uh, serious um, illnesses uh, since birth, and you know, did everything he could to you know um, make problems for his son. I mean, the guy, you know, could care, and, and as he was spending his wife's money, or more precisely, giving his wife's money away, he was taking the inheritance away from the, the, his children and the rest of the family. So, I mean, it was all about his image. So, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely something that can happen. So Manduza says, thank you so much for answering thoroughly. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm glad you asked. And uh, I do hope that uh, you do refrain from, I mean, as, as exciting as it may appear, um, <laughs> definitely in for problems. I'm referring back again to the uh, sexual involvement with a narcissist. So, um, so anyway, um, I think hopefully this will help because that's why it you know sometimes you see this person especially early in a relationship you know when they're trying to reel you in and and they seem to be able to listen so intently to you and, and offer advice and they're willing to help and and, and anything from you know uh, fixing your car to bringing you groceries to you know taking you out and and they just seem to be so caring and so empathetic and and, and, and this happens a lot, you know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, where, you know, some, someone is in the process of divorcing a, a raging narcissist or sociopath and, you know, is vulnerable because of that. And they come along and, and they encounter someone who just, you know, seems to be so helpful and, and willing to do things for them and, and help them out of the situation. And, you know, come to find out that, you know, you know, once the person is committed to this second relationship, it's, it's a total psychopath or a sociopath or, or narcissist. So th they can put on that act in the beginning as long as necessary in order to hook you. And, you know, once they figure that you've, you're hooked, you're, you're committed, you signed the dotted line, well, that behavior all goes away and you see just how shallow they are. It's, it's shocking, you know, to see, to see the change from this person who was so devoted to you and so willing to help to turn into this cold rock that doesn't do anything for, for you. It, it, it's just amazing. But that's what happens. So, um, oh, so Patricia says, thank you for the education. You're very welcome. And um, I, I hope that you take this information to heart and, you know, when your intuition is giving you a nudge that, you know, something not quite right about this person, then you can re rely on what you've learned by, with these videos. And um, it'll help you to steer clear. So, okay, everybody. Uh, that looks like all we've got for today. Oh, Gerard says, yep, beware of wolf in sheep's clothing. That's exactly what we're talking about. So... Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next week for the next episode of Love Fraud Live. Good night.